Hi guys, good evening. I am Elon Bogan, professor of zoology. So last class I taught something about uh, the tissues. We have completed the first part, the epithelial tissue, and we started the second part, the connective tissue. So other connective tissues we have, the main tissue, what we call this one connective tissue proper, and which the various categories what we just look into. And now the second part of the connective tissue, a specialized connective tissue, what we call this one, a skeletal tissue or a supportive connective tissue. So it is a specialized connective tissue, actually, because it is a modified one concerned with supporting the body. And normally, any connective tissue have a ground substance, what we call this one, the matrix, in which are suspended, we have the different types of cells. We have different types of cells and different types of fibers. And here also we have the matrix. The matrix is very tough. Not actually in fluid state or jelly-like or in semi-solid state. It is tough mostly in solid state. Because it has to bear the weight of the body. That is why it is having the weight bearing capacity. And based on the composition of the matrix and what are the different types of cells formed, we can have the classification of the supportive or skeletal tissue into two major types. One, the cartilage, and the one, the bone. Cartilage, the second one, bone. And both are entirely different. One main difference between bone and cartilage, you know that one, the cartilage is, cartilage is pliable, highly flexible, whereas the bone is rigid in nature. And secondly, normally, we have no blood vessels in the cartilage. But in the bone, we have blood vessels. This is, these are the two major differences actually between a cartilage and bone. High flexibility, elastic, pliable in nature because of its semi-solid nature. But the bones are normally rigid because of calcification. It's because of calcification, the presence of calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate and chlorides and fluorides of calcium also there. That, that's why it becomes rigid. So this, this is for acting with the weight bearing capacity to bear the weight of the body. So according to the nature and composition of the matrix, we have two different types of acting with the bones. One, the cartilage bones, another one, real bones or rigid bone or calcified bone. And if you are taking cartilage, once again, it is being actually classified in three different types based on the structural aspects, based on the location, etc. Accordingly, we have hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage and fibrous cartilage. And again the bones will go to, go to that one just one by one later. Now I would like to just give the outline classification of cartilage and bone. And based on the origin, based on the origin or based on the development, we have two different types of bones. One, the cartilage actually, the cartilage bones, then compact bones the membranous bones, spongy bones, etc. Cartilage bones, membranous bones, spongy bones and then compact bones. We will cover this one by one later. Now just let us look into the first type, the cartilage bones. Cartilage bones. So normally the general term used for cartilage is called gristle. The cartilage is otherwise called gristle. So we have different fields of biology likewise here. The study of cartilage is called chondrology. The study of cartilage is called chondrology because the cells are actually made up of substance, the matrix chondrine. The cells are called chondrocytes. That's why the name is given chondrology, the study of actually cartilage. As a general rule, it has been derived from the mesoderm, just like the muscles. So almost all the connective tissues have been originated, have been actually developed from the mesoderm only. All connective tissues, irrespective of the nature, structure, and other abilities. Now, about the cartilage, what I mentioned, normally it is solid, but playable, highly flexible, because it is semi-rigid. And also, it can have the ability of resisting against a compression. It resists against compression. So, where are they normally formed? In the adult body or in the case of actually embryos? As a general rule, the skeleton, namely the cartilage, is formed in the adult of cyclostomes. We have, for example, the lambics, the mixi, and also the cartilaginous fishes like shark, rays, scales, and also the areas of all vertebrates. 
So it is a skeleton of the adult cyclostomes, the adult Ellis membranes, and the embryos of all vertebrates. You have only the cartilage as the endoskeleton. And in all cases, even the bone, it is being surrounded. So any structure, any organ has been normally surrounded or covered over by a membranous covering. Here also the cartilage is covered by a fibrous connective tissue. There is an outer envelope made up of fibrous connective tissue. The name of the covering of the cartilage bone is called perichondria. As in the case of bone, it is called periastium. This is called perichondria. So, it is formed only in the case of adult elasmobranchs and cyclostomes and embryos of all vertebrates. And there is a membranous covering formed of what we have the connective tissue, a kind of fibrous connective tissue, what is called as a perichondrium, the outer sheet. Now, what is the nature of the matrix? What is the chemical nature of the matrix? So, normally the matrix consists of proteins, glycoproteins, glucose amines, an amino group containing sugar. So, proteins, glycoproteins, just glucose amines and chondroitin sulfate. This is a type of salt found in both bones as well as cartilage, chondroitin sulfate. So, proteins and glycoproteins, a glycoprotein is a conjugated protein. Also, we have glucose amines. So, amino group containing sugars and also we have the salt chondroitin sulfate. Now, normally the matrix is secreted by a cell to begin with. The name of the cell is called chondroblast which later only gets, gets modified into chondrocyte. To begin with, before the formation of the matrix, now the cells are called chondroblasts. Once the matrix has been produced, later the chondroblasts get converted to the chondrocytes, namely, the, actually, just what we call this one, the cartilage bone cells. Now, actually the cells are placed in some cavities, some spaces, what we call this one, lacunae. So, if you are taking any cartilage bone, we have some spaces inside, some hollow spaces or small spaces, what we call this one lacunae. So, in each lacunae, we have 1 to many or 1 to 4, we can say restricted, restricted number. 1 to 4 chondrocytes or the cartilage cells are formed and like the lacunae of bone cells where you have only one bone cell. So anyway, we have the chondrocytes, the cells of the cartilage, they are enclosed in small spaces. The spaces are called lacunae. And each lacunae, we have either one cell, or two cells, or three cells, or four cells. Unlike the bone cells, where you have in the case of bones, only one cell is formed inside the lacuna. But here we have one to four cells are formed inside the lacuna. And one main difference, what I just told you, just uh, while beginning the lesson, the main difference between the cartilage and the bone, there are no blood vessels in the cartilage. There are no blood vessels in the cartilage. But how does actually the cells, the matrix get nourishment? The cells and the matrix get nourishment from the surrounding membrane, namely the perichondrium. The perichondrium is highly vascularized, highly crowded with the blood vessels. And the perichondrium just draws nourishment from the blood and from the perichondrium the cells as well as the matrix of the cartilage draw nourishment. Now, we have in the cartilage, as in the case of connective tissue, there are two different types of fibers and they are responsible for giving firmness, the flexibility, the strength too that is not with the cartilage. The firmness of the cartilage, the strength of the cartilage, the flexibility of the cartilage, all because of the fibers found in the matrix. So what are the two types of fibers? One fiber is normally white in color, another one is yellow in color. The white fiber normally made up of a protein, what is called collagen. The yellow fiber is made up of a protein, what is called elastin. So we have two types of fibers as I mentioned. Number one, the elastic fibers. The elastic fibers are yellow in color and they are made up of a protein that is what is called elastin. These fibers are always formed in singles, not in groups, not in bundles. They are highly elastic in nature, that is why the name is given as elastic fibers and they are yellow in color, that is why they are called yellow elastic fibers. The second one we have collagen fibers as in the case of connective tissues. Normally all collagen fibers are white and they are made up of a protein what we call this one collagen. So it always occurs in bundles, unlike just actually the elastic fibers, the collagen fibers always occur in bundles, providing normally the firmness to the cartilage. As I mentioned,
mentioned in the flow chart, what it occurs in the flow chart, we have three different types of cartilages based on the nature, the flexibility, the color, etc., the opacity, or we have just transparency. Accordingly, we have different types of cartilage. So, there are all together three different types of cartilages. Number one, hyaline cartilage. It is also called as glass cartilage. It is also called as glass cartilage. The reason for the word is normally transparent, semi transparent. It is normally bluish, actually white in color. The color is bluish white. And then translucent in nature, that is why it is also called glass cartilage. Now, it is actually when compared to other cartilages, it is at least rigid, highly flexible. When compared to, for example, the elastic cartilage and also the fibrous cartilage, it is least rigid of all the three types of cartilages. The question is where are they formed? So we have this type of cartilage at the end of the nose. This area, the tip of the nose is formed of what is called this hyaline cartilage. And also at the articular surface, where two bones are meeting together, there is a place of articulation and movement. So the surface of the bone where the bone is meeting another bone for articulation is provided with a type of cartilage, what we call this one articular cartilage. This articular cartilage is made up of mainly this hyaline cartilage. So tip of the nose, articular cartilage. And also we have the rib bones. These rib bones are joining with the stone, that is what is called the chest bone, by means of a cartilage. That cartilage is called costal cartilage. That cartilage is called as a costal cartilage. That is nothing but actually cartilage joining the ribs to the stone. Then, so in the trachea, if you are taking the trachea, we have ring shaped cartilages. Incomplete ring shaped cartilages, what we call this one C shaped cartilages. So the wall of the trachea, the wall of the bronchi, all supplied with the C shaped cartilages, incomplete ring shaped cartilages, and they also this nothing but the hyaline cartilage. Then, during the development, so the embryos normally do not have the skeleton, namely the real rigid bone or calcified bone. So, these cartilages also form in the embryonic actually conditions. So, the embryos of all vertebrates are made up of only hyaline cartilage. There is no other cartilage, no bones form in the case of embryos during the development. So, we have these cartilages found at the tip of the nose. Then we have the costal cartilage, the articular cartilage, then we have in the trachea and bronchi and also we have just the skeleton of embryos all made up of this type of cartilage, what is called the hyaline cartilage. So always give importance to the location, the question is mostly coming mainly from the locations rather than from just actually the structure. Now this is the diagram, you see that one is the original diagram, actually a photo that is taken by the cross section of the hyaline cartilage. You can see the contour sides. Now it is a bluish white cartilage. The cells are placed inside the cavities. Now this is a cavity you can see in this one. A cavity inside which we have the cells what are called the contour sides. In some cases only one. Here you see that one there are two cells. So the number is ranging from one to four. In some cases in a cavity only one cell. In some cases we have two. In some cases three. In some cases four. That is the nature of the cartilage. So it is normally semi-transparent or transparent, that is why it is called as the glass cartilage. Now let us pass on to the next type of cartilage, the elastic cartilage. So the name itself implies that it is highly elastic. I mentioned already in the case of cartilage, we have two types of fibers, namely the white and yellow fibers or elastic fibers. So this is a type of cartilage which has only the elastic fibers or yellow fibers. When compared to the previous one, normally it is yellowish because of the presence of yellow fibers and also more opaque than the previous one. The previous cartilage is normally transparent or translucent. But here, because of the presence of yellow fibers, elastic fibers, the cartilage becomes more opaque than what is called the hyaline cartilage. And it is the only type of cartilage out of three which contains only just what we have the elastic fibers or yellow fibers. So the elastic fibers are only present in this type of cartilage. The elastic cartilage, you know, they are highly flexible in it. For example, if you take the yellow, you can just fold it. It cannot be broken while you are folding, while just compressing it. Nothing will happen to that one. 
This is because of the flexibility and that too because of the elastic fibers. Now, where are they formed? So, I mentioned it is a only type of cartilage which is normally containing the yellow fibers. That yellow fibers is highly elastic in nature. That is why it is called as elastic fiber due to the presence of a protein what is called elastin. Now, the cartilage formed in the yellow, just we can say just in three E places. I am just taking in a crude method, a simple method, we can find this one in three E places. One, the yellow. Then we have the epiglottis. You know a plate just actually covering the glottis, the respiratory opening through which it enters. So the epiglottis of a, actually a man is formed of this type of cartilage. So external yellow or pinna, the epiglottis and also the eustachian tube. So in human body or in vertebrates, the middle ear is connected to the pharynx by a narrow tube. The name of the tube is called eustachian tube. A passage connecting the middle ear region to the pharynx that is called eustachian tube that is meant for equalizing the pressure just inside the air and outside air. So the pressure being equalized because of air being swallowed through the pharynx that enters into the middle ear and keeping the air pressure equal on both the sides of the ear drum. That is why you can hear the sound waves. And that is the tube connecting the middle ear region to the pharynx for just actually equalizing the pressure on both the sides. So anyway, this type of cartilage is present in three key places. One, the earlobe, the stage tube, and also epiglottis. Now this is the diagram. Just we see that one elastic cartilage. We have the elastic fibers, and this is the matrix. This area will be, and we have the cells, the chondrocytes. We see that one, a small cell being present inside the lacrima having an out covering namely pericondrium. So in the case of elastic cartilage, hyaline cartilage, we have an outer connective tissue membrane, a covering that is called as a pericondrium. On both sides we see that one pericondrium is a section of what is called elastic cartilage showing the chondrocytes inside the lacrima. And this is the original picture that is being taken after the cross section has been made. See that one, these are all the cells. The cells are placed now. The central area is a cell, and just actually we have the central area is a cell, and there is a surrounding part is nothing but the lacrima. So the lacrima we have actually the cells inside the lacrima, and now this is a pericondrium. This is a pericondrium, just our most common. We have the cells. We have the fibers also formed here and there. Thin fibers, the elastic fibers. This is actually the original picture taken after making a cross section of the elastic cartilage. And this is the diagrammatic one, shows correctly. You have the pericondrium outside, that is outer coverings, and then we have the matrix. In the matrix, we have only the elastic fibers, and also we have the lacrimae having the cells inside. Now, the third type of cartilage, the toughest cartilage we can see, fibrous cartilage, which is highly inelastic. This is because the matrix contains no elastic fibers is being formed up only just the collagen fibers and that with the collagen fibers are packed with well. So it is the toughest and least flexible of all types what I mentioned earlier. It consists of very large number of the white fibers or the collagen fibers. They are just completely packing the matrix. So we have large number of bundles of collagen fibers that gives rigidity. And there are no elastic fibers, that is why it is normally inelastic in nature. So I mentioned already the elastic fibers only found in the case of elastic cartilage. But here in the case of the previous and hybrid cartilage, we have the collagen fibers which are found only in delicate fine structures, not found in bundles, that is why there is transparent in nature. But here the fibers are found in bundles and they are packing the matrix closely. So the matrix is closely packed with the bundle of collagen fibers. So we have no flexibility, so no elastic fibers and one more important thing, there are no blood vessels and there are no pericondrial membranes. So it is only cartilage without blood vessels and also without the outer covering. So other cartilages we have no blood vessels but they have the pericondrium which is normally vascular and the cells draws nourishment only from the pericondrium. But in this cartilage, 
there is a total absence of blood vessels, namely the capillaries, and also no pericondrium. The cartilage without blood capillaries and without pericondrium. So no pericondrium in the adult. But you have the pericondrium only in the embryonic condition, so I'm just during the development. Once the adult stage reached, now the pericondrium is completely absent. Already we have no blood vessel. This is additional character. And where you have this type of cartilage? So between the vertebrae, we have some basic shape structures. And it's a cushion avoiding friction while we are just bending our body. And even we have here, you know that one, one just a disorder because of the erosion of the intervertebral disc. What is called spondylitis. Some persons are, you see that one, they are just using the collar. This is because of actually the erosion of the intervertebral disc. A disc shape structure formed between the two vertebrae acting as what is called a shock absorber, acting as what is called a structure which prevents friction while bending the body. So, we have the fibrous cartilage formed in the intervertebral disc. Then, where are other structures? Cubic symphysis. Now, in human body we have the pelvic girdle. I think so, I studied something about that one. So, we have two pieces of pelvic girdle, what are called conchae. And each piece of pelvic girdle is formed of three bones. So I am taking a simple just actually, this is that pelvic girdle and it is being formed of uh, normally three bones, ilium, ischium and pubis. Now the two pubic bones are joined together by means of the fibrous connective tissue. This is what the I say, that is nothing but the pubic symphysis. It is nothing but a fibrous connective tissue used for joining the two pieces of uh, the pelvic girdle. That is the location. The two pieces of pelvic girdle are joined together by means of pubic symphysis. So we have these structures, namely the fibrous cartilage found in the intervertebral disc, the plate-like structures found in between the vertebrae of the vertebral column, and also the pubic symphysis, the one which connects the pubic bones of the two pieces of pelvic girdle, and that is what is called the pubic symphysis, the toughest cartilage we can see then also no pericontium, no blood vessels, unlike other cartilages. Now this is the fibrous cartilage, you see that one. Here is actually no pericontium. And we have the chondrocytes in rows and isogenic groups. That is more or less in equal groups. So the collagen fibers formed in just more numbers. That's why it's compact nature. The flexibility is less. And again this is the original picture that has been taken after making a cross section of the fibrous cartilage. See that one, we have the collagen fibers which are white in color and here and there we have the chondrocytes. These are all the lacunas with the chondrocytes. And this is nothing but a fiber cartilage without pericontin. No pericontin is found in the case of fibrous cartilage. So this is the diagrammatic one and this is the original section that has been taken from the fibrous cartilage. So the second important actually the specialized connective tissue, a skeletal tissue is nothing but the bone. You know that one in your body it is a structure which provides a framework. See, it provides a framework to the body. That's why it's called the structural framework of the body. It bears the weight of the body for various movements and locomotions. We are using this structure. Now, the, just like the cartilage, it's called what is known as a grizzle. Here, it is called as osseous tissue. The another name for the bone tissue, osseous tissue. That one is called grizzle. And it is the strongest supporting connective tissue, a specialized tissue, unlike the cartilage, where you can see the flexibility, somehow in the case of hyaline and elastic cartilages, but here it is strong enough and rigid. The reason for that one, due to the calcification, due to the formation or due to the deposition of calcium, the bones become rigid in nature. Now, the study of bone is called osteology. The study of bone is called osteology. It is derived from research as other connective tissues is also derived from Israel. So all connective tissues irrespective of uh, the nature, the types of cells all have been derived only from the Israel. So the study of bone is called osteology. So normally when you are taking bone in your body, I think so you are studying the skeletal system, the bones are of different shapes. Some of them are actually short, some of them are long, some of them are irregular, some of them are flat in nature. So I would like to give you some of the examples for irregular bones, the short bones, the long bones and also the flat bones. 
So where you have short bones, as in the skeletal system we have the wrist region and also the angle region, namely the corpus and metacarpals. The, sorry, the corpus, as well as what we have, for example, the tarsal bones in the angle region. These are all normally short bones, very small bones. And irregular bones, if you are taking the vertebrae, and also the bones of some actually in the skull region. Mostly the vertebrae, they are irregular. The irregular bones are nothing but the vertebrae, the piece of bone formed in the vertebral column. And flat bones, you know them, the ring bones. The ring bones are normally flat in nature and also the cranial bones are also flat in nature. Then the long bones, you know very well just in the body, the arm bones as well as the leg bones, these are all long bones. So we have short bones, we have flat bones, also we have for example irregular bones and also long bones. This is the general idea of what we have while we are looking at the body. Now we have different types of bones. All together I mentioned the beginning in the flow chart, there are four different types of bones. Now let's take the first one. The classification of bones based on the origin and development. Based on the origin, how far they are developed and also which is the origin place accordingly. So based on the origin and development, we have two different types of bones and each type has more than one name. The first one cartilage bones. It is not a cartilage but a cartilage bone. Or endochondrial bones or replacing bones. So these are all the bones normally replacing the cartilage. Already we have in one place in the body pre-existing cartilage is there. That cartilage has been modified into a real bone, a rigid bone because of ossification. The bone ossification refers to the deposition of calcium and also the rigidity of the bone matrix. So the cartilage bones are not cartilage. But actually these are all the real bones formed in places where you have already there is a cartilage, what we call this one a pre-existing cartilage. That pre-existing cartilage undergoes ossification, nothing but the deposition of calcium and becomes a bone. And this type of actual bone is called cartilage bones, not a cartilage but cartilage bones. The second type we have the membrane bones or dermal bones or investing bones. Now just below the dermis, actually just below the epidermis we have the dermis and the epidermis normally we have the epithelial cells and the dermis is formed of normally the connective tissues and in these places we have formed some type of bones by the membranous ossification by membranous ossification so we have the membrane normally we have the connective tissue in the form of a membrane just below the dermis we can say also basement membrane like this so, these membrane structures undergo ossification. The connective tissues normally membrane is ossification and that too present just below the skin, particularly the dermis. So, the dermal tissues, namely the connective tissues, undergo membrane is ossification. So, because they are thin and membrane like structure, where ossification occurs, deposition of calcium occurs, leading to the formation of a bone, and such a type of bones are called membrane bones because they are very thin in nature. That is why it is given in the notes as membranous ossification. Also called as investing bones because they are invested by other tissues. And also called dermal bones because the ossification occurs in the dermis. So, the bones are classified into two types based on the origin and development. One is cartilage bones, another one membranous bones. The membranous bones are formed in the place of dermis just below the skin. The cartilage bones are formed in the place where you have already cartilage that is being replaced because of ossification process. Now based on the structure, the internal organization, we can have two types of bones. One a spongy bone or cancellous bone. I think so you may have eaten actually a flesh or a meat of a sheep, a matter. And you can have sometimes occasionally you had this experience of just cutting the bone at the tip. Even in the case of chickens you can find. So the end of the bones are normally soft in nature like this. If you are taking a bone, the soft end, these are all the soft end. So the end of the bone is normally soft in nature and that bone is called cancellous bone or spongy bone. Because it has an irregular matrix. You may have seen this one while choosing that one at the ends we have some sort of what is called soft bone, a spongy bone and also it is called cancellous bone, spongy nature, you can break it easily. 
So it has an irregular matrix. The matrix is irregular here. And also, this irregular matrix has many irregular intercommunicating spaces. Intercommunicating, intercommunicating small spaces are formed, which give a sponge nature. So irregular matrix and also with many irregular intercommunicating spaces that give a sponge in appearance. And that intercommunicating spaces are filled with the red bone marrow. And this is what we call a sort of spongy bone or cancellous bone. And it is normally formed at the tip of the bone, at the end of the bone, what we call this one epiphysis. Epiphysis. So the end of the bone which is spongy in nature is called epiphysis. The end of the bone which is spongy in nature is called epiphysis. Epiphysis of long bones. And we will see later what we mean by epiphysis. And also on the ribs and vertebrae. So these are all the places where you have the RBCs are formed. Mostly we have one marrow, what is called red bone marrow. So the spongy region we have many intercommunicating spaces filled with the red bone marrow. There is a place of formation of red blood corpuscles. There is a place of formation of red blood corpuscles. And that place is called the epiphysis, where you have the red bone marrow. Now the second one, compact bones. The bones are very compact without any spaces. Intercommunicating spaces are absent. There is no space. It is normally compactly arranged in units. What we have the osteon, the units, the Havasian system. So the cells are actually the unit. The compact bone is made up of units which are compactly arranged without any spaces. Unlike what we have the spongy bone. There you have many intercommunicating spaces. And such spaces are filled with the bone marrow, the red bone marrow. So the long bones of arms and legs are an examples for the compact bones. Now in the case of compact bones we are taking actually, there are two ends. Suppose we are taking the thigh bone, namely the femur, or if we are taking what is called the upper arm bone humerus, there are two ends. The two swollen ends are called epiphysis. The two swollen ends are called epiphysis. And we have the main body of the bone in between the two epiphysis, and that is called as a shaft or what we have just a diaphysis. The two ends of the bones together call us epiphysis. Each end is called epiphysis, the plural for the word epiphysis. And in between this one there is a shaft, the main part of the bone that is called diaphysis. So normally the diaphysis contains inside a hollow cavity filled with a marrow, a bone marrow. That is a yellow bone marrow. So in the shaft region inside there is a cavity, what is called as a marrow cavity that is filled with the yellow bone marrow. But the epiphysial regions are filled with the red bone marrow. The marrow cavity in the what is called the diaphysis region is filled with the yellow bone marrow. It will come later about this one. This is the general one. So diaphysis contains normally you have so that is the yellow bone marrow. The epiphysis contain mainly the red bone marrow. Now this is the spongy and compact bone part. Now you see that from what I mentioned, this is the terminal head, the swollen head, what is called epiphysis. And there you have just the articular cartilage that is formed of what is called fibrous cartilage for articulation. And you see that one, this is another head, epiphysis, in between these two we have a shaft and that one is called diaphysis. This is diaphysis. Now which here encloses a cavity, what is called medullary cavity. The medullary cavity contains a marrow in it. The bone marrow. So the cavity is filled with what is called a marrow, what is called bone marrow, which is yellow in nature. Whereas the terminal things, the epiphysal, the epiphysal region or epiphysal regions, they contain red bone marrow. So the red bone marrow is concerned with you know that the production of the RBCs and WBCs. And now this yellow bone marrow is concerned with the storage of fat, highly delicious, large amount of blood blood vessels and also we have adipose tissue, the fatty tissue is formed. So if you are taking any bone as in the case of for example cartilage bone, here there is an outer covering, outer covering of fibrous connective tissue and that is what is known as a periosteum. So the entire bone on its outer surface there is a membranous covering of fibrous connective tissue called as periosteum. And similarly the marrow cavity, this is a marrow cavity. The marrow cavity is lined with another what is called fibrous connective tissue and that is called endosteum. So we have an outer covering for the entire bone periosteum. The inner medullary cavity or the marrow cavity is lined with 
a kind of another vascular connective tissue what is known as the endosteum endo and then just what we have periosteum so this is the generalized structure what we have the epiphysis diaphysis etc the medullary cavity we have articular cartilage normally found at the tips of the bones and that is nothing but actually a fibrous cartilage now structure of a compact bone what i described earlier let's go further in actually more detailed nature of the bone so normally each bone contains a central marrow cavity what is called as a medullary cavity what i mentioned and that one contains yellow bone marrow yellow bone marrow so why is it yellow because it contains fat so it contains large amount of fat containing the fat itself is what we call this one adipose cells adipose cells are seen in the case of for example adipose cells and they have only fewer blood vessels and like the red bone marrow so in the case of red bone marrow we have many blood vessels but here we have only fewer blood vessels so fewer blood vessels and again it is not hemopoietic what do you mean by hemopoiesis the process of formation of blood cells is called hemopoiesis the process of formation of blood cells is called hemopoiesis as this bone marrow namely the yellow bone marrow is not taking part in the formation of the blood cells it is not hemopoietic organ but as a red bone marrow is called as a hemopoietic organ because it is concerned with the production of the blood cells so that is hemopoietic and this one is not hemopoietic and again the red bone marrow is rich in blood vessels here we have only fewer blood vessels then i mentioned already the cavity is lined with the vascular connective tissue what we call this one what we see in the diagram also the endosteum and another vascular connective tissue covering over the surface of the bone what we call this one periosteum we see in the picture and already i described that one now if you take any compact bone the unit of compact bone is called a haversian system or osteon the unit the bone is made up of many units and each unit is called osteon or haversian system so a bone a compact bone is made up of many haversian systems or many osteons now if you take one unit so you see the diagram for example see this is the diagram a section of the bone you could see actually the osteon of compact bone the unit and now this is one osteon it is being actually pulled out it is being pulled out that osteon is called what is known as a haversian system the osteon is called as a haversian system now the inside which we have for example this is the spongy bone you can see many spaces intercommunicating spaces and they are filled with what is called the red bone marrow so there are nothing but trabeculae the partition walls may be the intercommunicating spaces are called trabeculae so the unit of compact bone is called osteon actually or haversian system and if you take one haversian system now it is being pulled more or less you see that what is the shape structure it consists of the following structures one a central canal and surrounding the central canal we have the protein matrix in the protein matrix we have the cells arranged in concentric circles so we have a central canal and then we have a protein matrix that one is arranged in concentric circle and alternating with this concentric circle of the bone that is right with the compact bone matter that is a matrix we have the cells are arranged in lacunae again in concentric circles alternating with what is called the just the bone matrix we'll see now once again we'll go back to the nerves osteons are have a sense system so these are all the structural units of the compact bones we will we can say the functional units of compact bone each haversian system has a narrow central canal like this this is what is called the haversian canal and this haversian canal is actually running parallel to the marrow cavity suppose this is the bone we have the marrow cavity now this is a canal which is running parallel to the marrow cavity all along its entire length now this haversian canal this is one haversian canal and we have another haversian canal just like this here we have for example let's show in the picture so this is one haversian canal there's a vertical section you see you see that it is running all along the length 
and now this is the Havasian Canal. This is the Havasian Canal. You'll see in the pic next to picture. Now the Havasian Canals are the adjacent Havasian system. This is Havasian Canal of one Havasian system. This is the Havasian Canal of another adjacent, actually another what is called the Havasian system. And these canals are interconnected by means of uh, another canal named after the name of the scientist Oakman's Canal. So don't forget Oakman's Canals are formed only in the compact bone, just with the bone tissue. So uh, we, are, we are talking about the bone tissue only and this is actually one unit is actually we are taking out and find out what are the components found in the bone tissue. So the units of the bone is called osteon or Havasian system. In the Havasian system, we have a centralized canal. You will see another picture. And that centralized canal, what I just rounded here is nothing but the Havasian canal. The Havasian canal of one Havasian system is connected to the Havasian canal of adjacent. That is Havasian system by means of horizontal canals. What I represented here is nothing but the Oakman's canal. So, Oakman's canals are formed in the bone tissue. Now, see the Havasian canal, the adjacent Havasian canals are interconnected by means of Oakman's canals. Now, each Havasian canal is surrounded by a number of lacunae arranged in concentric circles alternating with the. You see that one? This is the central canal, Havasian canal. And each Havasian canal contains actually a blood vessel of an artery, a vein, a lymphatic vessel, a nerve. And you see that one, this is a Havasian canal. And we have the matrix, the bone matrix is arranged in concentric circles. You'll see in the next picture also the same diagram, but a little bit you can get further. Now you see that one, the concentric circles of a lacunae. So this is one concentric circle. And this is a space, the pink color represents a lacuna with the cell, what is called the osteocyte. The cells are placed inside a lacuna or a space. Now you see that one in between. So this is one concentric circle of the cells. This is another concentric layer of cells, actual concentric circles of cells. In between which we have some filaments and then matrix. So the matrix is also arranged in concentric circles, alternating with what we have the bone cells arranged. Concentric circles of bone cells alternating with concentric circles of the bone matrix. The bone matrix is called as a lamella because it's arranged in the form of many layers. So, central have a central canal and we have the osteocyte localized in a lacuna arranged in concentric circle. If we have one circle of cells, the next layer just in between two concentric circles of cells, we have a space filled with the matrix that is called as a bone lamella. Let's show you that in the diagram. You could see just a better one. See that one, this is the central canal, have a central canal. In each canal, you have just one artery, one vein, then also one lymph vessel at now. Now you see that one, the concentric circles of the cells. In between the concentric circles, we have the matrix. The matrix is also arranged in concentric circles. So we have alternative concentric, concentric, sorry, concentric circles of bone lamella, the matrix, as well as the cells arranged. We have each Havasian canal is surrounded by a large number of lacunae arranged in concentric circles, what is shown in the diagram. All in with the concentric bone lamella, nothing but the matrix. So each lacuna, unlike the cartilage lacuna, contains only one cell, what we call this one osteocyte, where we have one to four cells in the case of cartilage. But here the lacuna contains only one cell, the osteocyte. So the osteocytes are arranged normally in concentric circles, that too there is nothing with the lacunae. So alternating with each concentric layer of cells, we have the bone matrix, what we call this one, the bone lamella. Now the lacuna of one actual layer is connected to the lacuna of another by means of minute canals and these canals are called canaliculi. So minute canaliculi connect the lacuna with one another and also with the Havasian canal. So the adjacent and to the lacuna are interconnected by means of minute canals, they are called canaliculi. The canaliculi not only connect the lacuna of the adjacent actual concentric circles but also they connect 
this actually this black pudding with the havasin cannot we'll see the picture later so normally the combat bone is highly vascular that's why we have the havasin cannot so each havasin cannot what I mentioned earlier have a blood vessel of an artery a weight a lymph a lymphatic vessel and also just a nerve to just to supply the branches to the bone tissue now this is a diagram what I said already this is one unit one have a cell system and you see that one, one red blood vessel and the blue blood vessel blood vessel in an artery and vein and also we have some just actually veins some veins artery and also some nerve and also one lymphatic vessel one nerve one lymphatic vessel one artery one vein is there And this picture shows the cross section of the bone taken. You can see the lacrimae. These are all the lacrimae with the sub. And this is the central havasin canal. And now these are all the interconnecting tubes. What we have the mind canals connecting the adjacent lacrimae also with the havasin canal. So they are the transporting system transporting the materials to each and every cell because they have been connected to the havasin canal, receiving the blood. Then from the blood they transport the materials to each and every cell and also transporting the or removing the waste materials from the cells towards the Havasin canal. That is a system, a complicated system. And this is a better picture. I want to show that one. Now this is the Havasin canal. You see that one, this is one concentric layer of cells. This is another concentric layer of cells in between which we have the matrix. Now the filamentous structures, they represent the canalic leaf interconnecting the lacrimae of adjacent concentric circles and also with the, also with just the canal the havasin canal located in the center a transporting system the same picture what we have seen just but with color now what is the nature of the matrix i mentioned already the matrix normally arranged in the form of concentric circles what we call this one as a bone lamella how is it actually formed? The matrix is produced by the osteoblast cells. To begin with, the cells of the bone are called osteoblasts. They are responsible for the secretion of what is called for the formation of the matrix and the secretion of the matrix. When the matrix have been formed, actually, the osteoblasts become converted or get transformed into osteocytes. That is what is happening at a later stage of development. Now let us go to the chemical composition. What is the nature of the bone? What is the nature of the bone? So normally, the bone is formed of both organic and inorganic substances. But the amount of organic compound present in the bone is lesser than that of inorganic compound. The amount of organic compound found in the bone is lesser than that of the inorganic compounds. So the organic compounds constitute nearly 35% of the dry weight of the bone. The remaining 65% is formed of inorganic compounds. So organic compounds 35%, inorganic compounds just actually 65%. Now let's see something about the different organic compounds formed in a bone. I mentioned already one type of salt, what is called chondroitin 4 sulfate. Chondroitin 4 sulfate. Then an acid, what is called an organic acid, hyaluronic acid, normally formed in the matrix of not only in the case of cartilage but also in the case of compact bones and large number of collagen fibers which give rigidity to the bones so we have chondroitin 4 sulfate and then hyaluronic acid the collagen fibers nothing but the white fibers made up of protein now it is a protein fiber it is an organic acid and this is a salt chondroitin 4 sulfate an organic salt so chondroitin 4 sulfate just we get the hyaluronic acid and large bundles of collagen fibers, the organic proteins are formed in the bone as organic compounds constituting only one third of the total weight of the bones. Now let's pass on to the inorganic compounds, what we have. So 65% of the total weight of the bone is actually formed of these inorganic compounds. And there is one question, what is a major salt formed in the bones? Actually, we are talking about the bone is rigid because of the deposition of calcium. But the calcium is formed in different combinations, in different forms of salt. So it may be present as calcium phosphate or calcium carbonate or chlorides and fluorides. Calcium fluoride and calcium chloride. 
Now, out of the total weight of the 65 percent, the major or lion's share is formed by calcium phosphate. Don't forget, the bone is mainly formed of calcium phosphate. The bone is mainly formed of calcium phosphate. And 10 percent is formed of calcium carbonate. And only just 5 percent is formed of chlorides and fluorides. 5 percent is formed of chlorides and fluorides. So anyway, the inorganic compounds actually in the bone is in the form of calcium phosphate or calcium carbonate or calcium fluoride or calcium chloride. But out of this one, the major lion's share is formed of mainly calcium phosphate. The next comes in for the calcium carbonate, only the least percentage of 10. And calcium fluorides and calcium just chloride formed only till actually still a lesser percentage of just 5%. Now we have the calcium phosphate. In which form actually the calcium phosphate found in the bones? So it is found in the form of a complex salt. The name of the calcium phosphate salt found in the bone is called hydroxyapatite. You see the formula also. So calcium phosphate, so it is actually hydroxy calcium phosphate. That is why it is given hydroxyapatite. So the calcium phosphate found in the bone is in the form of hydroxyapatite. So that is the nature of the calcium phosphate in which form it is formed in the bone hydroxy appetite. Now, so normally the bones are formed only from the mesoderm, particularly in a particular place, you know that one. In certain other conditions what will happen, other tissues also get modified into bony structures. That is why I give the statement in some special conditions. Bones are formed by ossification deposition of calcium occurring in other tissues also. So normally it is being formed in places of actually cartilage or in places of bone formation. In some cases, other tissues also have been modified into bones because of ossification, nothing but because of the deposition of calcium. One such modification is schizomoid bone. Schizomoid bone, nothing but the patella, the kneecap. So the kneecap is actually formed by the deposition of calcium that is in the tendon, the one which connects the muscle, the cordyceps muscle to the bone, just actually. So here the ossification occurs in the muscle, this particular in the tendon, the one which connects the muscle to the bone, there it converted into what we have the patella, this is a mind bone. Now in the case of horses, ossification also occurs in the heart, leading to the formation of some sort of bony structure in the heart, and that is called oscardis. The heart of some mammals, we have ossification occurs, and that is called oscardis. That is seen in the case of hearts. In some cases of animals, for example, bats, ossification also occurs actually in the penis, leading to what is called the formation of some bony structures in the bats, that is in the penis region. And that is what is called ospenis of some mammals, like bats and carnivores. See that one, the ossification is nothing but the formation of bones due to the deposition of calcium leading to a rigidity. A rigid skeleton being formed as in the case of patella or in the case of heart of horses or in the case of actually you have that is in the penis of birds and also some carnivores. Now the animal specialized with tissues, so we have started with the connective tissue. One, the connective tissue is proper. The second one you have mainly that is a supportive connective tissue or skeletal connective tissue. Now the third one, the fluid connective tissue. So both the supportive or skeletal connective tissues and the fluid connective tissues together a specialized tissue because they have some sort of modifications unlike the normal connective tissues. So the bones, cartilages and blood together call as a specialized connective tissue. Now we are talking about the fluid connective tissue because it is fluid nature just like the liquid metal you know that one mercury normally metals are solid but here you see that one the mercury is liquid in nature that is why it is called as a liquid metal. Likewise here we are taking a tissue you know that one a tissue consists of fibers the connective tissue just we have a matrix in which are suspended just we have the various types of cells. But one of the qualities what we have absent in fluid connective tissue there are no fibers. We have the cells, but the cells are not placed in a semi-solid or solid matrix, but the cells are suspended in a fluid matrix, namely the plasma, hence the name fluid connective tissue, but have different types of cells as specialized well tissue. Now, the study of blood is called hematology. The study of blood is called hematology. As, as I mentioned earlier, it is actually a fluid connective tissue. 
form of two components. One is a fluid component, another one a solid component. The fluid component is nothing but the liquid matrix in the form of plasma. Then we have the solid component is nothing but the different types of cells which are suspended in a plasma. They are called as a formed element, simply called as a blood cells. So in a volume of blood, 55% 55% of blood constituted by plasma, the remaining 45% is constituted by the blood cells. Now if you are taking a plasma, it is a liquid matrix, it is actually strong color in nature in the case of human beings. It is being formed of mainly water, 90-92% to 92 is formed of water, in which are dissolved or suspended other organic and inorganic substances which together constitute 8% so 90 to 92% water and 8% in the form of organic and inorganic even out of this 8% the major component is in the form of plasma proteins we see that 1 to 8% others are found only the least amount so now what are the organic substances found in the plasma mainly we have the plasma protein 6 to 8% we have alumin globally fibrinogen or also we have another one taking part in blood clotting process prothrombin released by the liver so out of this albumin forms nearly 4% so just we have 2.5% nearly about just globally the remaining only we have least among the fibrinogen and prothrombin so mainly we have albumin globally fibrinogen these are all what are called the plasma proteins along with prothrombin a clotting factor a type of protein released mainly by just the liver. Now the second one, the nutrients. After digestion gets over, you know that when all nutrients have been transported to the blood only. So we have all the simple nutrients formed as a result of breakdown process. Namely the amino acids of proteins, the glucose of carbohydrates or fractures of carbohydrates and we have just all the fatty acids, glycerol, etc. Other food nutrients, you know, the vitamins also form the minerals, all this is actually we are talking about the organic compounds. So, the nutrients, maybe the amino acids, glucose, fats, and vitamins, they are simplest components formed in the plasma. In addition, that one to keep the blood always in fluid state, that fluidity of the blood is maintained because of the presence of an anticoagulant substance released by, you know, that one, the master cells, what is called the heparin. It is an anticoagulant keeping the blood always in fluid state. Then the hormones. So there are no ducts for the endocrine glands. All the liquid components released by the endocrine glands are transport only through the blood. So the blood is a transporting medium for the hormones because all the hormones are formed in the plasma only. And also the waste products are transported to the various excretory organs like kidneys. And that is because of only the blood. So we have the main waste product urea along with addition waste product what is called creatinine. A type of waste product formed from what is called a creatine phosphate, a kind of substance found in muscles. So this is what we have the organic substances in relation to the plasma. Now the inorganic components include the various actually this minerals in the form of sodium, calcium, magnesium. Then we also have bicarbonates, calcium, just add with the chlorides, etc. And that is about what we have the inorganic components. So in addition to that one, we have to just go into the different types of proteins. The plasma proteins, what is the role, how far they are useful in maintaining the blood. So most of the proteins, you know, that one act as a buffer. They are responsible for actually keeping the fluid, fluidity of the blood and also responsible for the transport of actually blood and also responsible for maintaining the what is called the fluid nature of the tissues so all being because of the proteins so we will see about the different types of proteins in the next class what we have seen generally there is albumin, globulin and fibrinogen we will look into the specific functions of each one in the next class as time is actually closing I am concluding this part the most welcome to ask questions no questions so far from this actually section that is from you so try to just ask questions, we are ready to answer it. Thank you. Once again, we meet you tomorrow. The class is completed.